This is the fifth of six hour long videos on the subject of psychology and specifically you versus you, the psychology of you the fundamental essence but not just you the fundamental essence that is the person but you the fundamental essence that is part of your family part of your uh, social structure part of your social class your social grouping the you that is connected to 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 the conscience so we're going to be doing some donut economics and at the end of that so we're going to be doing some donut economics during which because economics is pretty dull usually I'm going to be burning 950 pounds of my own money which will hopefully hold hold people's interest interest um, it's money I can ill afford my car is 10 years old I really need to be looking at buying a new one I rent my flat and it's going to be difficult to do retakes so this is a bit of a one-off however it, it is the fifth episode I have already made six so this for me is the very final one it's the end of a long long road i'm very happy to be reaching so uh you versus you two versus vous in French class, they used to teach us that tu was the familiar version and vu was the formal version. I'm thinking uh, it's more useful for me to be thinking, to be able to distinguish between tu as in the individual you and vu as in the wider familial and social you. So, donut e economics. <clears throat> Don't know if you've seen the uh, the green circle, which is the uh, original model for donut economics. It's a little bit complicated, but in essence, the inner ring represents the social grouping, and the outer ring represents the world. So this is the group on a grand scale and there are a number of categories around the outside and even more around the inside. So let me just relate this to the subject today before we get stuck in. So the reason why this does relate, that's, I can't, I can't, I can't claim too much actually. <coughs> It may just be pure coincidence, but it is interesting that this is a donut picture in the sense that the conscience is at the centre of the mind, the personality is at the edge of the mind, and the individual, too, is in complete control of both the centre and the outside. So a donut is an appropriate model for for us to be using. It may be, it, but I don't want to claim more than I I don't want to claim more than that. I want to apply the donut to both to and vu. And so what I've done is to simplify it slightly by coming up with six categories 
and where more than six is needed, subdividing one or more of the categories into a further six. So this will uh, <coughs> make it easier for me to relate the inside and the outside of the circle. So the inside of the circle relates to the personal you, the outside relates to the social you. The personal you, <coughs> the personal you has a need for the world to provide you with air, water, land, not to use up all its resources so there's nothing left for you, not to kill all its animals and not to kill all its plants. If we want to make that a bit more sophisticated, then we could say we also need the individual, every, every man, woman and child of us, needs the land to contain, the land to have uh, soil, uh, we need the sea to be preserved, we need some degree of diversity, so it's not all a wheat field. We need to do something about global warming, we need to protect our history, and we need to protect our culture. The, that contrasts with the you that needs to eat, the you that needs to drink water, the you, the you that needs a roof over your head, the you that needs to be able to go to a doctor when you're ill, the you that needs to be able to needs to have received schooling and be able to send their children to school and the you that needs to have legal rights and if we want to make that more sophisticated then the rights that every individual needs to have to live a, 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 a bearable life are voting rights legal rights equal rights rights to move rights to movement power and network rights and also I've put in working rights, although there's some complication there, if not throughout. Okay, that is all we need to get us started. Now, I've got two diagrams to show you to put this into practice and both of them are economic diagrams. So what I've done is to compare the wealth of the world against the population of the world. So I've done that, the reason why there are two is because in one of it, we're on the outside looking in, and on the other one, we're on the inside looking out. So it's two ways of looking at the same information. Let's start with the distribution of wealth. If I want to draw that as a, do a donut, I'm going to have to be on the outside because I'm not rich. So I'm going to have to be part of the 90% <clears throat> that is represented not by 90% of the diagram because that would mean that 10% of us were rich. Not by 90% not by 90 of, the, of the diagram, because that would mean 90% of the population owned 90% of the wealth, which would be great, but it isn't the case. What is the case is that 90% of the population owns 15% of the world's wealth. So from the outside looking in, we can see a further 9% of the population, which is this light blue ring, owns 45% of the wealth. 45 plus 15 is 60%. So the dark blue ring is actually the 1% of the population that owns 40% of the wealth. Now you might look at that and think, surely how can that be 
those circles look a bit funny. Well, that isn't that I think the reason why that is so graphically successful is precisely because it shows the, the truth. The what I've endeavoured to do is to use the area of the circle, not the perimeter and not the radius, the area of the circle to represent the information. That's that that's how I'm making use of the donut. So the, the area of a circle is pi r squared. My numbers are straightforward, 100, 85, 40. If I say pi r squared equals 100 pi, pi r squared equals 85 pi, pi r squared equals 40 pi, then all I have to do is take the square root of the number and that gives me the radius I need to produce the circle of the correct mathematical size. And I've drawn a 10 by 10 square so that it's visually obvious that that is indeed what's happened. So taking, for example, the 40%, the square root of 40 is 6.32, so that's a little over halfway, as opposed to 85%, the square root of which is 9.22, so that's almost all the way. And what this means is that 15% of the population is moving money around the edge of this circle in both directions. A lot of that money, but not all of it by any means, but a lot of it, is going inwards to the 9% to maintain their significant fraction of the wealth. And then, of course, a large amount of that money is then going inwards still more to preserve the wealth and increase the wealth of the 1%. So if there were arrows on here, you'd have arrows going that way, arrows going that way, and you'd have arrows going that way. Because that's how money works. Another way to think of it is when you get to the end of a game of Monopoly and all the properties are sold up and you can only ever land on one of the free squares or else pay rent. You can't buy anything because there's nothing left on the board to buy. That's kind of where we are now with money. It isn't a conspiracy, it's just how money works. Let's have a look at the other side of the donut. So this time we're looking at population in terms of this area. So now I'm inside the circle. I'm one of the 90% and that really is 90% by, by area of the, of the donut. So the 90% the of people here who are economically excluded <coughs> are the ones who, do, who are doing everything that's remotely interesting. The tiny, tiny number of people who are in these very, very small outer rings are very, very constrained in terms of what they can do. <clears throat> the most effective thing they could do is burn their money. Well, that's not going to happen. So what?
the figures I've quoted come from a, an, an article uh, in the newspaper uh, from something like 2004. So they've gotten worse since then. And and are likely to continue getting worse. And this is simply because of the way money works. When the Occupy movement uh, took over, uh, I say took over, when the Occupy movement started its protests in London, um, I made, made a talk based on this subject and went to the Bank of Ideas to present the talk essentially putting forward the idea that money works by being accumulative, not distributive, and therefore it, it will continue to do so. What I wasn't proposing was revolution, and what I also wasn't proposing was that we take back all this money for ourselves. The problem is not that we're poor, the problem is the poor are poor and recently there's been protests in America, Black Lives Matter, and I'm pleased to see people standing up for themselves. That's what's, that's what's needed. However, what I would prefer to see is poor lives matter. Until we're at that stage, until there's a solidarity amongst people on the basis of poor lives, then to, as opposed to vu, is not part of this 90%. So when I first gave this talk, I said, we are the 90%. I was at pains to point out that the enemy is the 9% and the 1%, not not white supremacists or 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 whatever that are in the that are in this 90 percent however we're not yet at that stage i no longer think we are the 90 percent I, I i no longer suggest that i suggest we we will be the 90 percent but not not until poor lives matter clearly the amount of money is such So I don't want to make myself rich. I don't want people who are already perfectly well off and, and need to become engaged. I don't want them to make themselves rich. I do want the poor not to be so poor, but then very few people would be against that. So what am I what am I saying what am I trying to pass over to you? Well, there are two um, elements that I would absolutely highlight. So the first is get angry, stay angry. It's made a huge difference to me initially when I met initially when I read this article for the first time in a long time, I was depressed for a few days because it took me a while to really be able to take on board this information. <clears throat> Since then, I've not been <clears throat> depressed, I've been angry, and it makes me angry to read about injustice. So that has turned out to be a great strength for me because it means that I can tap into that energy and I can manage it I can use it to motivate myself to do this kind of work and I can balance it. So I would say that you don't have to fix the problem overnight. It's going to be a series of steps. And I would say absolutely the first step in my case was caring about it and 
and getting angry about it. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is much more geared to to and vu. I ask a question of myself whenever I'm tempted to play the lottery, which happens less and less. And the question I ask of myself is, would I prefer never to have won the lottery or would I prefer to have won the lottery but lost all the money? There's a difference in how you answer that question. And it's a difference in self, which is what we're talking about, to and who. What is the difference between unselfish and selfless? The question is answered by the answer to the other question. To be unselfish is to have the money and not mind giving it away. To be selfless is never to have the money in the first place. I lean and have leaned for a long time towards the selfless side. That's a natural thing for me. That's a natural way to be. If I've got the money, I'm actually pretty sensible with it. I'm actually pretty careful. I don't want to give it away. I do give it away because I have a conscience, but it's not, I don't, I'm not nice to people who ask me for money. I, I, I was for a long time, but I'm afraid I got old and jaded. In my work, it is a noticeable advantage to be I think selfless. In other words, to um, to take what I would like to do and then do the next thing. So that's not very well explained. It doesn't matter whether you choose to be selfless or unselfish. It doesn't even matter if you choose to be one and then the other. I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that my way is better or right or even necessarily better for me because how would I know? I'm happy with it. That's all I'm suggesting. But what I do think is that the old battle is with the self. You know, a lot of people are playing the selfish game. A lot of people are out there scrabbling away for tiny crumbs from the table. There isn't the healthy contempt for money I'd like to see. What there is, is a genuine fear of it. And that is a terrible thing to see. Without solving that problem overnight, take a step backwards and, and understand that the enemy is the self and moving the self out of the way is the answer to the self. There's no getting rid of it. There's no way being either unselfish or selfless involves not being yourself. That, that, it's a complete misunderstanding if that's the conclusion that you're, you're trying to uh, defend. It's just as selfish, no, it's just as, it's just as selfist to be unselfish or selfless as it is to be selfish. There's just as much self involved in all of those situations we are not trying to kill the self, we are managing the self. 
because that gives us a better outcome. It's as simple as that. What does it mean then to <clears throat> to burn money? So what? Well, I can tell you one thing it means. Uh, it, it annoys people. <clears throat> I'm kind of disappointed to discover what it actually means to me is that obviously I haven't given this money to charity. I give other money, money to charity. What, what isn't the case is that this money, <clears throat> it actually has no effect whatsoever for, on the money supply for me to burn it. It does, it does no harm to money of any kind. I, I, <clears throat> I, must, um, I must point out that on the £50 note, just like on all other pound notes, the words are, I promise to pay there on demand the sum of £50. What you're actually doing, what I'm actually doing when I set fire to a banknote is I'm letting the Bank of England off that promise. What I'm effectively doing is paying tax. It's no different. So by giving money to charity on the one hand and by burning money on the other hand, all I'm doing is being a good guy. It's not an effective, it's not an effective um, action against money. So I don't want a revolution. What I do want is a think tank. What I want is people who are looking at how to become an enemy of money, how to practice being an en enemy of money. What are the, the principles? And we've already We've already got one right here. If, if I could make a promise to you, what would that promise be? Well, it wouldn't be anything to do with money. It wouldn't be giving away my work for free. Uh, who cares? Who cares whether I give it away for free or money? I care, but nobody else cares. So what if it costs 10 quid? Who, who, really, who really minds? Is that the basis for deciding whether it has value or not? Of course it's not. It's just... <clears throat> it's just a convenience. And this is why money has no inherent merit. Whereas a promise... Now, if there was a way for me to go on record with a promise, think what I could have done. I could have said, I promise I will reveal the shape of the universe. I promise I will demonstrate that Plato is wrong. I promise I will never be rich. I promise I will become a philosopher. I'm not sure about that one. The point is, if there was a, if there were, so how would we do this? Well, we would do this with a blockchain. So we would, we would use the blockchain technology to record transactions which involve anybody making a promise to anybody else, whether it's a promise made by two or the, it's recorded and it's indelible. You cannot say, oh no, I never said that. You can, you can, you can say, I know I said that, I'm just not going to do it. 
you can break your promise at any time. Absolutely. There's no comeback. It's just down to your pride. And that is one of the That is one of the reasons why this is all founded on this, because intelligence is a product of pride. I perhaps wouldn't be much of a lover of truth if I wasn't prepared to tell the truth about myself, even when it's embarrassing or shameful. So I'm going to very quickly run through my personal life history like I have my work life history. And we, <coughs> we, we have found a way to kind of pick out the key events from each decade. Um, so starting with a dream I had when I was, I can't, I've, I've no idea how old I was, probably five, something like that, um, where I dreamed that a statue of God fell on my head and broke. And I remember feeling that uh, I'd acquired a whole set of responsibilities that uh, previously I hadn't had. So a bit of an odd dream for a, for a young child to have, but it did, I, I still think, have a, a radical effect on my thinking process. <clears throat> they call it being woke when you, you know, you you realise kind of the wider picture. And I think this was a very, very extreme version of that. So, um, so let's, so let's put it in terms of decades. So let's say naught to 10, then obviously uh, 10 to 20 is school and I've been asked in the past if I had trouble at school, if I found school difficult and the answer is very clearly yes, um, culminating so much, culminating unfortunately in attempted suicide at the age of 13, fortunately not successful, um, but I vividly I remember going to, um, I remember reading books like um, Jennings and thinking, well, the, the, the school that, that is described in these and other books is not in, in the same universe as the school that I'm in. Um, as a result of that, I changed schools and I went to a school where, where some of my friends from primary school had gone to. Um, it didn't make me any better at being at school, but it did mean that I, I ended up with good friendships and that made a difference. An example of, um, of, of the oddness of things was that I wrote an English essay about uh, Antony and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play, and my teacher said, oh, Martin, this is really good, this, this could be published. To which my response was, well, that, you know, well, <clears throat> to, to which my response was largely silence. I, uh, to me, it wasn't a surprise that it was good enough to be published because, uh, because of kind of who I was. And um, uh, 
so uh, it, it didn't do me any good it, it, it there was no there was no there was no benefit to it which is why i didn't react at all when i was said when when that was said unfortunately this completely alienated my english teacher who um who uh you know quite reasonably um backed away and uh, and 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 was then kind of neutral um in 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 my corner uh, so i'd made an enemy you know without um without sort of understanding uh just just through lack of understanding uh <clears throat> The uh, the feeling I had in my in my teens and in my twenties was one of extreme discomfort, extreme cognitive dissonance. I mean, my thought processes were not uh, healthy. Um, I, I, I sort of think of a normal train of thought as as being a circle. Obviously, the starting point might not be the same as the end point, but the point is you've, 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 for whatever, for whatever, whatever, <coughs> through whatever mechanism you start a train of thought, you get to the end of it and you move on to a new train of thought. But my my pattern of thinking tended to be a bit more like this. It, it, it would kind of spiral off to these deeply unpleasant areas of thought about you know self-worth and 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 self-value and um you know fundamental problems with with um with um what to do in any situation or or or, or what to do about anything um It's not as if I was particularly a victim. I mean, <clears throat> I um, I was not uh, nicer than other children. I was not more good than other children. Um, rather the reverse. I, I I remember things that to this day cause me cringing embarrassment, um, and the I'm. I'm I'm pleased to be able to report that it's as if it's almost as if they happen to somebody else. I mean, I have I I'm only cringingly embarrassed because even if that happened to somebody else, I'd be cringingly embarrassed. Um, it doesn't feel like they're my memories. It doesn't feel like it was me, and I feel like I don't remember the vast majority of my early years, and I'm very happy not to. Um, I'm drinking pretty heavily throughout throughout my twenties, um, but at least I'm working in, in in computers, which is something I can do, and at least I'm, you know, playing sport and and particularly squash, uh, which is also a, a, a bit of a a bit of a um, which is also very valuable. Uh, but I think if anybody had said, "Here, have some cocaine, have some heroin, have some, um, have some uh, amphetamines, or, or or anything that 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 would have reduced that that um, those those feelings," I think I would have fallen fallen completely into that trap. So I was very lucky uh, n that things weren't worse um, in my twenties. Uh, I did uh, <clears throat> I did obviously uh, meet many girls um, most of whom I was not very um, I met many pretty girls to whom I was extremely attracted but um, I was not in a position to um, really uh, 
I was not I was not particularly in a in a position to give the girls I liked the sort of good time you need to be able to give somebody else. Um, it culminated in something that to this day I uh, is is probably my most difficult. It's probably the the memory I feel least happy about, which was um, in a meeting at work of all places. I um, I was very strongly attracted to this girl, and I had this thing about truth where I thought you you know you can't not tell somebody if that's how you feel, um, but uh, I. Uh, could there were many opportunities where I could have, you know, opened my heart honestly, um, uh, to that person, uh, but in a way that I will, in a way that, um, in a way that causes me shame. I, uh, I ended up declaring it in a meeting, uh, a team meeting, uh, obviously totally inappropriate and, um, and uh, well, shameful. So uh, that, that was the end of that job uh, in due course. I, I obviously had to leave after that. Um, so then, uh, after a period of time and at, the, and, and at this time I'm starting to do the writing as well which is really making a difference um, which is really going to make a difference I mean throughout this period the period of girls it was really a huge disadvantage because it created a, a, a barrier I couldn't uh, I couldn't cross over um, but I did have what you might call a proper girlfriend in my 30s, the one and only proper girlfriend I've ever had for a short period. But and uh, those are the sweetest memories um, of all. And it made a huge difference. It, it, this whole period was a turning point. Um, as and although it was only six months, um, and although afterwards I concluded that you couldn't really have, you couldn't treat girls, um, the, you couldn't ha you couldn't have a relationship with somebody and at the same time close off the most important part of yourself to them, particularly if they wanted children and you were not in a position to give them children. So that was really the one and only time uh, for me but you know what a what a tremendous uh, op, what, a, what a tremendous um, what a tremendous thing to have those memories to sustain one in you know for 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 a, a period uh, for a period to follow and then we get to 40 plus. A funny thing happened to me when I was 40. I'd always been tone deaf. Always. My, I have musical cousins who are gifted and they used to laugh at me whenever I opened my mouth to sing because I was so painfully obviously tone deaf. When I was 40, I suddenly gained the ability to sing. And something else happened at the same time, which is that my, this chain of thought that I've that I've talked about, this way, this normal way of thinking, my my thought process suddenly changed, and it was like a can. I my my thoughts were going round in my head. I mean, that's a, that's a that's a good way to put it, and they would. Whereas before they had, how I, how I understand it now, how I put it now, whereas before they had jumped up, they had jumped out to these extremely cognitively dissonant 
thought 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 paths. Now it was it felt like a can. It felt like there was this lump, and then they jumped back in on track. And And over, <clears throat> I mean, that was, a, that was a period of time. There was a period of time when it was quite painful to listen to the music. And then once I got through that period and got over this camshaft kind of feeling in my head, I, I was able to sing. I'm still able to sing. It's a great thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I'm very happy. But what I'm most happy about is that my thought processes are unrecognizably different now. I don't, I don't, um, I, uh, I, I turned a corner across, through this period I turned a corner and the corner I turned was back towards mental health, having been in some way, which I don't fully understand, slightly out of my mind. Um, obviously a long, obviously a long time, but there's also been a long time since when I've been benefiting from being, you know, quite, quite mentally, um, mentally secure while I do this kind of quite ambitious work that I've been doing. So. In my 50s, I discover the truth about money. And that was one time when I was depressed, when I found out the truth about the horrendously unequal distribution of wealth in the whole world over the course of time. I was, for the first time in a long time, quite depressed just for a couple of days. But what that did do for me was it consolidated my anger it gave my anger a place to be and so really one of the reasons why I'm so much better able to manage my cognitive states these days is that I can switch that anger on and off just by reading you know uh, something on the internet about the, the, the about unfairness um, that sounds, uh, that sounds, um, that sounds controlling. I don't mean it to sound controlling. I mean, I genuinely do feel angry about unfairness. Um, but you can only fight so many battles and it's quite, it is quite healthy to be able to pick and choose your battles. And that's really what this did for me. It gave me one, one front. And then we reach now, where I'm getting to the end of my 50s. And of course, uh, work-wise, socially, I feel at the top of my game, I'm equanimous. I have equanimity about the past and, uh, and my history. And, uh, you know, all in all, it's, it's all turned out rather better than... Um, than one might have expected.